Hey everyone, sorry for the radio silence of the past week. I have been revisiting one of my favorite places on the planet, the groves of giant sequoias in and surrounding Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. After the terrible fires of the past few years and reports that large numbers of mature sequoias are dying off, I wanted to revisit the area and see the impact of the fires for myself. Having just spent days wandering the forests and groves, there's lots to discuss. So make sure to stay tuned over the coming weeks for updates on the status of the remaining giant sequoias. And if you haven't already, this would be the perfect time to hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss out on any upcoming videos or park updates. For now, let's return to Yellowstone National Park. The big news of this week is that in a remarkably short time, the entire Grand Loop of Yellowstone National Park is again open to all visitors regardless of license plate number. And in related news, thanks to the flood, would-be visitors have been canceling reservations in droves. Where it would normally take months, if not a year or more of foresight to secure a reservation at a campground or lodge within the park, there are a remarkable number of openings this season. So, if you've been wanting to experience Yellowstone firsthand, this just might be your year. But whether you visit the park this year or another year, I think it's time to share the secret of how to have a dream Yellowstone National Park experience. As stated in recent videos, I have been visiting Yellowstone National Park and the surrounding area at least once a year for more than a decade now, and have visited the park many times before that. In that time, I have made mistakes and fallen prey to bad advice. Here's how you can fare better than I did. The harsh truth is that most visitors have been settling for an inferior Yellowstone experience since the park's creation, and in the internet age, it's only gotten worse. Collecting culture is certainly part of the reason. Many visitors are so preoccupied with visiting all of our parks that they rush through settling for a superficial experience typically copied and pasted from somewhere online. And the problem has become epidemic. Just recently, a very popular travel YouTube channel published a video bragging about touring five national parks and a few state and tribal parks in just seven days. Having visited all of the parks mentioned several times, it was a tragedy that someone would rush through those incredible parks and landscapes like that. And I was even more concerned that someone might watch such videos and decide that a rushed collection of parks is something to aspire to. Similarly, while spending days exploring California's groves of giant sequoias, I chatted with a number of other park collectors who were bragging in some cases of visiting six national parks in the American Southwest in six days. And again, having visited all but one of the parks they mentioned, I'm telling you, there's simply no way to appreciate even one of those parks in a single day or less. Now, all parties expressed great satisfaction in their park experience. And for people who have limited experience exploring our parks, that makes sense. Our parks are really that amazing. For most park visitors, these landscapes are entirely unlike anything they've seen before. So even when visitors treat them like the McDonald's drive through they leave a lasting impression. But I would argue that collecting culture does harm to our parks and deprives visitors of incredible experiences. At Home in Wild Spaces is definitely more focused on quality than quantity. And on the topic of quality, internet travel culture is absolutely bursting with horrible advice that is poisoning the park experience long before visitors ever arrive at park gates. Internet algorithms feed on alleged must-dos, top tens, and ranking videos. And YouTube and other platforms reward content creators for making these lists even if they're total garbage. Yellowstone, just like all our national parks, and the people who go to visit them are suffering at the hands of platforms focused primarily on ad revenue. The reality is, online algorithms have never been to Yellowstone. They haven't a clue what the park really offers or how to get the most out of your trip. So they look for patterns in the form of repetition, watch time, likes, comments, and so on, advancing information based solely off of internet activity, which, as we all know, bears questionable resemblance to real-world experiences. But because so many park visitors are afraid of missing out, and because terms like must-do are so ubiquitous with travel culture, 
They repeatedly searched the internet for lists of must-dos and similarly deceptive content. And the internet obliges. Even if the list was created by someone who has only ever visited the park once or twice, and almost certainly pilfered most of, if not all of their list, from a similarly unreliable source online, or from the map handed to every park visitor upon entry. The result is a damaging feedback loop, which hyper-focuses activity on a handful of areas and damages the park and the park experience for those hoping to enjoy the best Yellowstone has to offer. There is a reason I keep returning to Yellowstone and other places year after year. It's because most of our parks offer a lifetime of incredible adventures. I've seen and experienced things that only the tiniest sliver of park visitors will ever get to experience. And it's because I don't visit Yellowstone with some dubious list of must-dos. I let Yellowstone set the agenda. And I relish in the surprises the park throws my way. Last year, I was speaking to some campers in the site adjacent to my own. They were first-time visitors and desperately wanted to see a wolf and asked me if I had seen any wolves and where they should go. And as luck would have it, I had just watched a wolf chase a herd of bison and subsequently wandered down to the riverbank just across from me to get a drink. After drinking from the river, the wolf stopped and began howling. And for a time, it was just me and the wolf. It was yet another example of an unplanned, incredible Yellowstone experience to be added to my already extensive list. Now, no doubt spotting my long lens focused on something in the distance, a car full of anxious onlookers pulled up right behind me, and as I stood there near the riverbank, they asked, Do you see anything? To which I responded, There's a wolf across the river. If you turn your engine off, you'll hear her howling. The moment they turned off the car, they heard the wolf howling, and as you might expect, they were absolutely thrilled. This story, like so many others, perfectly illustrates why so many park visitors settle for a superficial experience, even if they don't know it. Those in the car who pulled up behind me were lucky that they stopped and asked the one guy on the side of the road if he saw anything. Dozens of other cars rushed past me, completely clueless of what they were missing. And isolated in their cars, didn't have a chance of hearing the wolf's long, haunting howls. I showed some of the footage I captured of the wolf to my campground neighbors and gave them the same advice I gave the people in the car and everyone else. The only way to have these kinds of experiences is one, to get extremely lucky, or two, to slow down. Turn the car and modern technologies off and give Yellowstone time to surprise you. The wonders of Yellowstone are everywhere. But they are constantly in motion, from herds of bison and packs of wolves to grizzly bears and thermal features, Yellowstone is a living landscape, one that follows its own schedule, and the park and its wildlife honestly don't care how many nonsensical must-do videos you've watched online. In Yellowstone, the closest thing you will get to a predictable scheduled event is the aptly named Old Faithful Geyser. And even Old Faithful doesn't follow exact schedules, erupting approximately 20 times a day. And plus or minus 10 minutes or so, the Park Service is generally pretty accurate in their estimates regarding each subsequent eruption. But the point is this, Yellowstone will follow its own rhythm. If you want to get the most out of your visit, give yourself time to get in sync with the park and realize there's no way to experience it all in a single visit. And with the exceptions of staying safe, being courteous to the park, its wildlife, and your fellow travelers, there is no such thing as a must-do list. For this reason, those who speed through the park, trying to fill a nonsensical checklist of must-dos, may get lucky and still very much enjoy their visit. But they're still most likely to have to settle for an inferior experience, not because of park closures, but because they took bad advice from the internet and did not slow down and give Yellowstone the time it deserved. Now, if collecting parks is what you're into, this probably isn't the system for you. But if you want to truly connect to our parks and have experiences that others can only dream of, you have to slow down and give our parks time. I honestly don't know that I'll ever visit every one of our national parks, in part because I hope we continue to add to our portfolio of protected wild spaces but also because I'm not convinced that collecting parks is that rewarding of a goal. 
I'm far more interested in connecting than I am collecting. There's a great quote by John Muir that in my opinion ought to inform every visitor to our national parks and wildlands. Muir knew the value of slowing down and sinking with nature. He would tell his fellow wanderers, I'd sit for hours watching the birds or squirrels or looking into the faces of flowers. When I discovered a new plant, I sat beside it for a minute or a day to make its acquaintance and try and hear what it had to tell. This is a far healthier and I'd argue more rewarding approach to exploring our wild spaces compared with treating our parks like a frantic run through the McDonald's drive through You don't have to spend a whole day with a single plant, but there's great value in slowing down and opening up your mind and your heart to the wonders of the natural world. And don't be afraid to turn your phone off and ignore social media for the duration of your trip. There's a reason you didn't hear from me the entire time I was exploring the sequoias this past week. I was there to be in nature, to connect and reconnect with trees and groves that feed my soul and raise my spirit. And you can't do that if your eyes and hands are constantly tethered to your phone. The internet and social media are only helpful up to a point before they become a liability and a distraction from things that are just more important. The Navajo have an incredible symbolic and spiritual tradition. When a new child is born and their umbilical cord falls off, they take the cord to a place that is special to them and bury it. And from that time on, it serves as a physical reminder of their connection and dependence on Mother Earth. Now, I'm not advising that any of you start burying umbilical cords, but I hope that there are special places that remind you of your connection to and dependence on the Earth. For me, Yellowstone is one of those special places. As someone who knows Yellowstone National Park better than most, I would advise you to ignore the Internet's endless lists of alleged must-dos and instead take what time you can, slow down, and truly connect to this remarkable landscape. If you do that, and educate yourself on how to stay safe and protect the special places you visit, then you'll have experiences that others can only dream of. And if you want to make sure that you get only the best travel information, then make sure to hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss future videos. And for those of you who have been patiently waiting for part three of my Grand Canyon Rim to Rim guide, I promise I haven't forgotten about you. The flooding of Yellowstone just pushed my production schedule back a few weeks. Look for part three to drop soon. And if you haven't checked out part one or two yet, then I definitely advise making them a priority. You will not find better Grand Canyon travel resources anywhere online. And if you're planning on visiting Yellowstone soon, remember that while the Grand Loop is again open, the roads between Mammoth and Gardner and between Roosevelt and Silvergate are still closed. You'll want to plan accordingly and stay tuned for more Yellowstone National Park updates. And with that, this is Mike reminding you to have fun, stay safe, and give yourself time to connect to our precious wild spaces.